today we're going to continue our journey in the series that I've started in Ephesians. And the text for today's message, uh, if you turn in your Bibles, you can follow along with the overhead if you'd like, uh, is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 24. And, and last week, um, I had actually planned on taking a, a larger chunk of the first part of Ephesians chapter 4, but I could only make it to verse 6. Well, this week, um, we're going to continue. Um, Paul is continuing to speak to the Ephesians about practical unity in his church, in, in Christ's church. And in the letter, uh, we see that it was specifically crafted for the Gentile believers that were in Ephesus. And Paul was explaining that God's word had been given to them not just for information's sake, not just for information to be known, but God gave them His Word to express the manifold wisdom of God meant to be put into practice. So Christianity is not just a bunch of good ideas. It was meant for us to apply. And they were also advised, and, and there was great emphasis placed on this, that we're not on a solo journey. God puts us together with other believers to work as a team. And that includes Jews and Gentiles coming together, and that includes um, Gentiles, brothers and sisters under Christ from a diversity of different nationalities, a diversity of different backgrounds, a diversity of different cultures where Jesus Christ is the head of his church. Now, today we're going to talk about equipping and about a little bit about the gifts that God gives. Now, when you become a believer in Christ, you become a part of the family of God. And along with being part of a family, God gives each one of us individually responsibilities. And he gives us different gifts in accordance with his goodwill, just as he determines. And he does this to accomplish his purposes. Now, God doesn't need us as human beings to do anything. But God desires for us to be part of a family and to be united with Him, and to be united with one another. So when God decides that He wants to do something in this world, He invites His children, He invites us to the table to participate with Him in His blessed work, in His, in His, in His good work. So each one of us sitting here today, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you fit somewhere in the body of Christ in a specific way. And the Lord wants you to know that your, your place in His family is important to Him. You are very precious to Him. Now you may think, I don't have a whole lot to offer. I don't know what my gifts are. Well, maybe you're in the process of discovering this. But God has a very precious and specific role for you to play in His family, to work together with Him, to join with Him, and to join with, with his, with his fam other family members to accomplish his good work. Paul knew that the believers he was addressing in his letter, that they came from very different backgrounds. He also wanted them to know that because of this diversity, there was strength because if you think about a, an operating body, right? If you've got fingers and you've got toes and you've got eyes and you've got ears, each of these things play an important part in the functioning of the body, in the health of the body. So you might think, oh man, I don't have a whole lot to offer. Well, you know what? None of us really do in ourselves, but God calls us to, to serve Him with what He's given to us. 
And this is, we're going to be talking about that a little bit today. It was God's design that the church be built strong in diversity and unity under the bond of peace. So reading from verse 7 of our text this morning, we uh, read this. But to, who, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all of the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Well, maybe you're here today and you go, well, how do I fit into that, Pastor? Why, why have I been made the way that I've been made, I, I kind of wish that I was the, the thumb. Well, maybe you don't wish that you're my thumb because it's missing. But you see, I know something about this. See, with that missing thumb on this one side, I, I tend to drop things. It takes me longer to do things than it used to when my thumb was healthy and intact. You may say, well, I don't really have a huge part to play in in the body. But you know what? When you're missing from the body, it becomes very apparent to the body that there's something missing. It takes longer to do stuff. You drop stuff. You know, I've come to the point now where I don't get angry when I drop something and it breaks because I've come to the point to accept that. But you see, as believers, God wants us to be the part that he's called us to play. He wants us to do this because God understands how we fit into the big picture. There was a, an illustration I had meant to, to give a couple of weeks ago about this, but I think it's appropriate right now. You see, it's like in life, th there's this big puzzle, and um, there's so many different pieces to the puzzle, and it's only when the puzzle pieces start coming together that we see the big picture take place. We, where we see it come together. And, and, and it's like, you know, God has this, he has the box. And he shows us the box and he says, see, that's what it looks like. Well, I'm looking at the table right now and I, 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 all I see is a jumble of pieces. But as the pieces start to come together, clarity comes and we see this beautiful tapestry that God has created. And did you know that the body of Christ is a beautiful tapestry? And when God looks at his people, when we're worshiping together in unity this morning, when we're, we're together, we're encouraging one another, and the Lord looks upon us, it's a beautiful thing. It's very much like the mountain vista that was, was um, being expressed that, that you appreciate, Kim. You know, we, we are the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is beautiful. And when we work together, God brings us together and takes these pieces and forms them together. And, and we become a, a, a united body of, of people that bring glory to God. And that's why the scriptures say that the world outside of us will know that we are His disciples by the love that we have one for another. Because it's a beautiful thing, and, and the world is anything but loving out there. The church actually can be the expression of God's love. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4, the apostle um, Paul phrases it this way. He says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given, not just for me, but for the common good. We exist to glorify God and to edify, which means encourage and, and, and give strength to one another. 
we're better together. We really are. When we're together, we make a difference in this dark world. Each of us, friends, each of us has been given a measure of grace in order to fulfill our own personal calling to glorify Him collectively. God gives each of us these different uh, gifts in accordance with His grace. And, and I, I should note this, that when God gives gifts, it is by grace that they are given. Grace is the basis for the distribution of spiritual gifts to the church. What that means is grace, the free, unmerited giving of God. No one deserves or has earned any of the spiritual gifts that we offer back to Him. They are freely given by God because of His love for us. And God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows where you fit. He sees the far-reaching um, things that we can't possibly see. So just as he determines, he distributes his gifts to each person. In his sovereign wisdom, he descended to the earth. We see this in the first part of our text today. He descended to the earth in order to set people free and to lead them to heaven as his captives. Now, Jesus, it's like this rebel horde. We were once a rebel horde. The Lord came down, and he actually showed us how captive we were to the, to the things that were, were wicked, to the things that were not right, how far we were from him. Our eyes were opened by the Spirit of God to show us how lost we were. And then we come to know Christ we come to know Him and we surrender our lives to Him. And we're born again in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, the blinders come off and we see how beautiful the Lord really is. And how wonderful His plan is for us. And we, we, we read the Scriptures and no longer are we just reading some story. We're reading the truth and our heart burns with this, I guess it's, it's this connection with the living God. He's called us. And one day he's coming back for his church. If we pass away before then, to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus ascended and he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father God. God the Son sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And one day we're going to be united with him. And this is just a taste. And God wants us to experience the glory of His salvation here and now and to be able to express the wonders of His glory to those that do not know their left hand from their right because of the spiritual darkness that clouds their vision once the blinders are off. Now, I had one fellow at study this, this week. He was... He was just overwhelmed by the grace of God. And, and one of the things, I, I have a real soft spot in my heart for this man. He, he was tearing up and he was saying, if I only knew what it was like before I would have given my life to Jesus long, long ago. And just to see that heart melted before God was so beautiful. God in his sovereign wisdom calls out to a lost world and says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Peter says it well. You know, the Scripture illustrates so well what other Scriptures say. You ever notice that? It's not just in one place. God speaks in, in different places to bring the truth to light. And the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, he says, For you know it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, 
He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. You see, Jesus is in the business of liberating slaves to disobedience. My yoke upon you and to his family. And he says, take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy and my, my load is light. My, my burden is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And he has decided how each of us are to fit into the plan as he builds his church. And because of his great love for his people, Jesus has given certain people foundation building gifts. And he also encourages us people by giving others in his church equipping gifts. And the foundation building gifts are coupled with equipping gifts. But there are some equipping gifts that are not necessarily foundational gifts. I've mentioned before, but it bears mentioning here again. The church can be pictured like a stone building made up of living stones linked together, rising from a foundation, becoming a place where God dwells within the stones themselves and also corporately as the stones are together, being a place where God dwells amongst the people that he dwells within. It's an amazing picture, and we talked about this this morning, in the worship set, where Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. See, Jesus is the starting point for the house of God. He is the head of the church. He is the chief cornerstone by which all the other stones that make this building up take their bearing. The foundation is made up of Jesus as this cornerstone along with the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament church that laid down the groundwork for what we see um, in the scriptures right now. When you read the Bible, this is part of the foundational work that God laid for, down for his church. Now, going back to the theology of this, in Ephesians chapter 2, we're just going to read Ephesians 2, 17 to 22. We read this. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. So Jesus called people to join with him in setting the foundation for the church building throughout the ages. And these people were with Christ. They were with him while he walked on the earth. They were his apostles and his prophets. And they were laid down together, taking their bearings true and straight from the chief cornerstone, who is Christ, at the start of the church's foundation. The foundation level needed to be strong. It needed to be true. It needed to be in the right direction. It needed to be straight and true. For the entire church throughout the ages would be built upon this foundation. We must shake this incorrect concept that the church is merely an institution made by man or an actual physical building in which people come to meet in from week to week, to take part in religious activities. My friends, that is not the church. The church is living stones. It is you. It is I. Those of us who have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus and have been set free to worship him in spirit and in truth, we are the living stones that make up the church. 
The church belongs to Jesus. And it is com comprised of God's people who've been set free from the penalty of their sins under the new covenant in His blood. You heard a lot about this morning in worship about I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. This is what brings us into new life where our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. For by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's not something you can earn lest any one of us should boast. We all deserve the wrath of God, but God in His mercy saw fit to call us by name into His precious kingdom. See, and when the church was first established, Jesus gave certain people foundational leadership gifts. When you build a, when you build a building, if any of you here are contractors, you know what I mean. When you build a building... The quality of your building starts with the foundation. If the foundation is true and square, I don't know, I mean, I've got this treehouse that I live in. It was made like a treehouse and everything's out of level. It's real difficult to do anything with it because everything's, eh, you know. But when you have a building that is true and square and has good quality construction, when your foundation level is that way, it makes it easier for it to rise as a building that is quality. And I tell you this much. The church, the bride of Christ, is a beautiful building. It's a beautiful building because the one who mastered the design is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he calls out to each one of us and says, Humble yourself before my mighty hand. And when we do, he leads us as his captives towards glory. You see, so he, he gives these gifts too of the apostles and the prophets together with others who would follow. These leadership gifts, he gives these building and equipping leadership gifts for purposes. And that is to make sure that the start is the template that leads to the future building. And we're part of that building right now. And this is why in Ephesians 4, he said, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What is he desiring? He desires us to grow in maturity to the, to the fullness, to the whole measure of fullness in Christ. So at the ground level, at the start of the Christian church, Jesus was laid down as the chief cornerstone. God's temple is his people now. The third temple in Jerusalem might rise, but that's not where God dwells. God dwells in his church. And who is the church? You. If you believe you are the body of Christ, you are the church. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So his apostles and prophets were chosen at that time to lay the foundation level, and they were directly tied in and linked into him. God saw fit that the gifts he gave at this time in history were foundational for the future health of his church. The New Testament speaks of people as being appointed to the positions of apostle and prophet. These people were given their gifts by God to establish the foundation of the church for ages to come, to be built upon. And for this reason, and I'm going to be abundantly clear, in our church, we do not believe that the gifts of the office of apostle and prophet continue today. The office does not continue because these gifts are foundational building gifts and they're required for the establishment. There is no further foundation required for the establishment of Christ's church than it has already been laid. 
It is the foundational level, and I want to be very clear about this, because today there is a popular movement that is making brash claims about itself, and this movement claims that God is raising up a huge wave of end-time prophets and apostles who will be instrumental in subduing entire nations and eventually the whole world before Christ returns. They claim that those of us who do not submit to this prophetic apostolic movement will be judged or moved out of the way. These apostles and prophets were told by this movement will be so powerful that people will be struck dead if they show up at the meetings that they hold with sin in their lives. The new apostles and prophets will have power over nature itself. They will be a new breed of man with revelations, power, and prophetic insight not seen since Christ himself was on the earth. My friends, I want everyone to clearly understand this. This is incorrect theology. It is false teaching. It's taught by some well-meaning persons, and I know that some people have kind of bought into this. But the foundational gifts that were given for the establishment of the church were laid down. Theologian F.F. Bruce made reference to this, and I believe this is how God wants us to understand the apostle and prophet in the New Testament church. Apostles and prophets constitute the foundation ministries in the church. Apostles and prophets, then, might well be viewed as the first stones to be laid in the new building. And we see in Ephesians 4, 8 to 10, and we call these the five-fold ministry leadership gifts of the church, mentioned in verse 11, were given to the church as Christ rose and ascended. He established his church, and he put leadership in charge. And the effects of all of these gifts that we continue to see taking place we see the apostolic and prophetic gifts in the Word of God. Not a stroke of pen in that Bible that you hold in your hand comes merely from a human perspective mind. The New Testament that we hold in our hand was given by God as His divine authority. It was written by the apostles, influenced by the, the, the prophets at the foundation level of the church so that we have this. Now, I'm not saying, and, and please don't get me wrong with this, okay? I'm not saying that there's no apostolic gifts or prophetic gifts that are in operation. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that the office of the apostle and the prophet was made for the foundation of the church by which the whole body of Christ rises upon. The apostolic gift, you know, when you, when you see people going out there and planting churches, that's an apostolic gift that God gives people to break into a new place. Missionaries have this gift that God gives, but they're not, they don't hold the office of apostle. They have apostolic gifts. God works in accordance with the Spirit, as the Spirit determines in, in prophetic word. We are not cessationist here. We believe that God continues to operate in the spiritual gifts that He's given to the church as recorded in the book of Acts. But it is as He determines, and the office of prophet like that of John the Baptist and Elijah that is not something that continues. That was laid down on the foundation level. I would encourage you, if you're having trouble with this, because I know some people have been listening to an awful lot of stuff out there, I would want to sit down with you and dialogue with you about this if you've got questions about this. So please, look at your Bible. Read your Bible for yourself and see if what I'm saying is true or not. Because there's an awful lot of preachers out there that are telling people just to listen to them. If I say something that's in contrast to the Word of God, then I'm, I'm wrong. And I need to be corrected. 
right? But that goes for every one of us. If we're saying something that's contradicting something that God says in his word, we need to stand to correction and humble ourselves before the word of God. When these fivefold leadership gifts operate in the church, these fivefold ministry gifts are for the health of the body of Christ. And it says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, maybe some of you are puzzling on this because you thought, well, I thought there were modern-day apostles and prophets. When you think about how God illustrated um, in his word of how the church would be, Jesus Christ was the chief cornerstone. There's not more than one cornerstone. There's not more foundational cornerstones to be built upon Christ as the ages go by. There's not additions onto what he established in the beginning to be the foundation for everything to follow. There's one cornerstone. We then should not imagine that there are a whole bunch of other apostles and prophets laying new revelation down for us to follow in addition to what has been laid. Now, the gifts of an evangelist, pastor, and teacher, however, these gifts continue in the present day until... Christ returns until everything has reached its fulfillment. Why? Because these gifts are given, they're given for, for building and for edifying and strengthening the existing body of Christ, the building that's going up. The apostles, they walk with Christ their divinely inspired teachings are the final and authoritative foundation. The pastors, teachers, and evangelists are equipping the people of the church, encouraging the people of, church, of the church in their faith to be strong and to be built up in Christ. Evangelists, they teach people, they have giftings, they teach people how to share their faith. They have this gift in sharing their faith, and they teach others how to. Um, pastors, it's a shepherding gift. I've got a shepherding gift. Why? Because I'm to encourage you. I'm to, I'm to come alongside you and strengthen you in my gift, just as you strengthen me in your gifts. But the teaching and the, and the, uh, the shepherding, that continues. It's not a foundational gift as the apostle and the prophet were. You don't hear the New Testament of Clint. You don't hear that. And, and if, you, if you did, I'd expect you to leave. Right? Because my word is to be measured against the, the foundation that was laid down. Like when I'm encouraging you in the faith, when I'm sharing these scriptures with you, you need to be discerning what I say measuring it against the Word of God, tossing out what is not of the Word of God, and coming to me, if necessary, to say, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? If I'm going to be giving teaching, then I better be ready to accept a critique of that teaching. This is too important, you guys, for us to go astray. Like, the whole... The whole church, God designed the whole church to be a light in this world, to be his representation on the world. We have a job to do together, collectively. We need to encourage one another 
Our gifts are all given so that we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. You know, all leadership gifts, including those that are foundational and those that are equipping, were given to the church by Jesus. Why? So that the church might become mature in their faith. Paul says these gifts were given for our protection, really, if you look at this. Verses 14 to 16 says, Then we'll no longer be infants, tossed back and forth, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect, in every respect, the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. See, stability and maturity in the faith are important to God. He wants us to grow in stability and in maturity. You see, he knew the followers of Jesus would need to be built strong so they could resist the temptations that would eventually come. This world is wicked. Every corner that we walk to, there is, it's just seething with evil and wickedness. It, it hits us from all sides. And, and these people in Ephesus, many of them, had family members and friends who didn't know Jesus as their Savior, and they had this thick blanket of spiritual darkness shrouding their city. And Paul knew that many of them would be tempted by their enemy to fall back, to fall back and to yield to their own fallen nature, their old man, their old lady. He knew that they were going to get tested, that they were going to get tried, that they were going to come under temptation because the devil does not like the body of Christ. He hates us. The powers of of this world's darkness long to see us rendered ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of Christ. See, Paul knew this. And many of them had significant influences of family and friends, just like we do, who would likely be pressuring them to return back to their former ways of living, of sinful living. Assuming maybe that their newfound faith in Christ was just some passing fad that would soon wear out and they could move on. Paul understood that it was only by God's strength that these people would be able to stay strong in their faith, including us. This reaches down to us, too. So this is why he wanted to speak truth to them, encouraging them to reject what is evil. When you come to temptation, there's going to be a variety of temptations that you're going to encounter. So Paul says it to to them in this way. He says, So I tell you this and insist it on the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding. You hear that? Darkened in their understanding. And separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Sin hardens. Hardens the spirit. And the world that does not know Christ is hard. Hardened heart. The only way and the only hope is if God breaks that hardened heart. Breaks it up. And tills it. And pulls the rocks out. Because otherwise, their heart and heart is just like that path in the parable where the seed of the word of God goes out into the world and some falls on hard ground and the birds of the air came and picked it off the heart. That's, a, that's an illustration of how the hardened human heart, the word of God, comes and hits it, but it's rejected. And then the evil one comes and takes it away. Paul also gave this instruction. He says, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Paul's saying, beware. Beware of the sin-laden heart. Friends, you are no longer slaves to sin. If you've become born again in Christ, you're no lo- sin-, sin is no longer your master. You're no longer a slave to sin. You have been led captive by Christ and your yoke upon you is one of righteousness. 
But you still have a choice to make. You have decisions to make. Temptation will still visit your door. So when you recognize this, recognize your Savior has set you free from that and say, no, Lord, help me, because I can't resist this on my own strength. I need your Spirit to help me. Walk in fellowship with the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the desires of the sin nature. The Apostle Peter gave the same message in his letter to Paul, as his letter to Paul. Sorry, the Apostle Peter gave the same message in his letter as Paul did in his letter. Does that make sense now? Okay. In 1 Peter 4, 3 to 5, Peter writes, For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join with them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse upon you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Why do people sin? We all sin as people because of the old nature. We're rebels, naturally. We sin with our thoughts, words, and deeds, and sin comes from that disobedience passed down from the the fall in the garden. Each person has this inherited nature. Disobedience to God brings this darkening and hardening to the Spirit of God. These people that do not have the Spirit of Christ, who are not of Christ, they're separated from God because they're hardened to the fact that He brings true life to the world. In disobedience, they are dead in their understanding of the spiritual side of things. And the spirit of man is deceived by thinking that he doesn't need God and that he can navigate this life on his own, without God, but he couldn't be more wrong. Couldn't be more wrong. There's a way that seems right into a man, but it leads into death therein. Jesus told a parable about a man who thought he had the world by the tail. In Luke 12, 16 to 21, he says, and he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Things were going pretty well for him, right? great harvest. The barns were overflowing. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Oh, friends, that's the way of the world right now. Everyone out for themselves trying to amass things to make their lives more enjoyable, to to make their imprint on this world, all this confidence that people have. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. Boom, over in an instant. Life is a vapor. And we stand before the living God on Judgment Day. As Christians, we can be thankful, right? Why? Because the blood of Jesus has covered us. And when God looks at us, He looks at the robe of righteousness of Jesus. And that's the good news. That's the good news for us. And that's the good news that God wants us to work together to share with others. Why? Because they're lost. And God loves them. God loves your next door neighbor. He loves the guys you work with. And He wants them to know Him. He wants their eyes to be opened and the darkness to fall off of them and come to know Him and be resurrected inside and and be born again. He wants them to be part of this, this train of captives who have the beautiful yoke of Christ on them. The yoke that is easy and the burden that is light. Set them free from the shackles of darkness. And you and I are ambassadors. And our gifts are given so that we work together to see the message of Christ explained to this world in a way that they understand. Yep, there's going to be some that are going to go, I want nothing to do with you because I like the way things are going. 
and, you know, take off, man. Just have your own religious thing and let me be. And I want nothing to do with you. Why? Because their wicked deeds do not want to be exposed. They don't want to be exposed. So they push away. But then there's some that God calls whose hearts will open and say, what is it that you have that I don't have? you got something going on here that I wish I had. Can you tell me what's going on in your life? You know, when they look at the church, they need to see the light of God. They need to see us as we are, set free, freedom, full of joy in the Holy Spirit, unified, loving one another, caring for those in need. The church ought to be out there doing all these things, helping people when they're down, ministering to the broken when they need to be picked up. That's what we ought to be doing. So Paul says, and this is, I'm going to end with this. You know, that's the way the world is, guys. They're full of all this hardness. But that's not the way of life you learned. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to, be, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Did you hear that? You are no longer a slave. You are free. You're free to follow Jesus and to be holy as He is holy. So pursue righteousness. Pursue a life that is pleasing to Him. Why? Because your nature is calling you to do that. Your spiritual nature that Jesus has resurrected in Him. The living nature that's in, in you that Jesus brought to life is calling you to be holy as he is holy. Amen. Let us pray.